I'm impressed with this turnout. We left uh, Ithaca, New York this morning uh, at about 8 o'clock, and uh, we thought nobody would come because the weather is so terrible, <laughs> but th thank you for coming. What I really wanted to start off with here is, you know, really what we're talking about is, is a, a much larger problem. And, and let me just say, I, I think everybody here has heard of the organization 350.org that was started by Bill McGibbon. Well, the title or the name of that organization is based on 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And what he said was that, well, when, not he said, actually James Hansen of NASA said that once we get to 350 uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the Earth will reach a tipping point where we'll have climate change that will be irreversible. Does anybody know where we are now? We're much higher. We're about 390. Uh, but, so, but that's just carbon dioxide, OK? We, we have other things in the atmosphere that cause climate change. Uh, th this thing over here is carbon dioxide, and everything is actually referenced to that when we talk about climate change. But what we're really talking about t tonight, in particular, is this other molecule, methane, or natural gas. Uh, the government says that methane is 32 times worse than carbon dioxide on a uh, time scale of 100 years, but we really don't have 100 years to change um, our, our, the way we're doing things. When we think about methane, we should really think about it on about a 10-year time scale, which is really, which means that methane is actually 100 times worse than carbon dioxide. Actually, the reason why for the difference is that methane goes away rapidly uh, in the atmosphere and actually turns into CO2. So the point I want to make is that methane in the atmosphere is something that changes our climate rapidly, and if we can do something about it, then we can make major changes for the better. So that's really what we're talking about here, is how can we control uh, methane release into the atmosphere. That's one of the many things we're talking about. So more specifically, what we're talking about tonight is, is fracking and the infrastructure associated with it. But really, the infrastructure the whole life cycle of the project and the infrastructure is huge. Um, it really starts in the, uh, when we start considering, you know, where are the, even the raw materials for fracking. And that, that actually uh, was brought to us in a, in a really major way when we visited the sand mines in Wisconsin. They have some of the same problems that we do here in terms of mining, uh, trucking, drilling, the actual hydraulic fracturing process. Now, I don't think there's probably very many people in the audience that don't know what hydraulic fracturing is, but the whole idea is that the uh, industries drill down into the earth, turn the bit horizontally, and then break open layers of shale, releasing methane gas and letting, letting it come back up into the atmosphere. The industry says we've been doing this for 60 years. That's actually wrong. They've been fracking since the mid-19th century, okay? That was, the first fracking actually was done by explosives in New York State near Fredonia in, I think, 1854. But what's different in what we're talking about here is the huge vol volumes of water, sand, and chemicals that are used and the huge amount of methane that's released into the atmosphere with this process. So New York State has banned this what we call high volume hydraulic fracturing. And so the question is, what has changed since you know, when the ban goes into effect? So that's what's changed. All this other stuff we could still do in New York State, including sand mining, by the way, which has been proposed for the Adirondacks. But this isn't exactly right because we could still do hydraulic fracturing in New York State. It's just high volume hydraulic fracturing that will be banned. And we don't know whether fracking with propane or fracking with nitrogen in horizontal wells will or will not be allowed uh, when the final ban comes out. So all these other things are still possible in New York. And what really worries me, or one of the many things that really worries me is, is on the next slide, and that is that we have 
thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of wells in New York State that have been drilled since the mid 18th century. We don't even know where all of them are. Most of them have not been plugged or capped. Most of them are, have been abandoned. Uh, not only are they leaking methane into the atmosphere, but some of them we don't even know where they are. So if we ever did do fracking here and we connected to those wells, we'd be in big trouble. Uh, I'm going to stop right now. I'm going to let Michelle talk a little bit, and then uh, she'll tell you all the interesting stuff, and then I'll come back and make a few more comments. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm just going to talk uh, for a few minutes um, about the book and then turn it back over uh, to Robert. Um, I think the most important thing to know about our book is that the very best part of this book was written by Sandra Steingraber. Um, the next best part of this book uh, was written by this guy over here, my husband, and the rest I wrote. Uh, it was a lot of fun, but we were very fortunate to have Sandra on board with us from the beginning. She was very excited about this. In fact, she was hoping to write a book on fracking herself. Uh, and she's become very, very involved in the Seneca Lake protests, constantly, always involved. And she uh, told me recently, she said, you know, you wrote my fracking book. This is it, so I don't have to write a fracking book. Uh, um, so at any rate, um, we've divided the book into uh, sections. And I had many more cases I wanted to put in this book. I had about 20 cases. Uh, the editor said no more than 10. Uh, we started writing the book with as much um, information and documentation that we had. We realized it was way too long for 10. I had to cut down again to six. One of the chapters has two, two cases in it. So uh, that's where we are uh, with the cases. Um, the uh, terms that you see up here all have to do with um, infrastructure, pretty much. Um, and all of this is in our book, but um, to circumstances beyond our control, these terms never showed up in our, um, in our index, but they are in the book. I just wanted everyone to know that. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, now is just talk for a few minutes about uh, some of these uh, cases. Um, infrastructure issues run really throughout um, the book. I think the most important thing, uh, take home message from today, is to keep in mind that uh, as far as these cases go, and a number of them are, have moved, and they're continuing to move out of these areas. All of these cases that are in the book come from Pennsylvania, but we have cases from all over the country. People are moving uh, uh, as much as possible when they can. Um, and while their health impacts in themselves and their animals go down, um, they still have some health issues to deal with. And um, some of these health issues aren't going to be seen for a while yet. Because we're talking about long-term, low-dose health uh, effects uh, due to some of these uh, uh, chemicals um, that are pretty uh, commonly known to be out there. For instance, benzene. Um, that's a volatile organic compound, and that's a carcinogen. Um, we have benzene, toluene, and xylene are teratogens. That means uh, those are chemicals that can cross the placenta and cause birth defects. Um, we have things like out in Wisconsin, the people out there are really worried about all the crystalline silica uh, going around. 2.5 microns gets into their lungs and causes silicosis. Um, they ask us, well, what's going to happen to us if we move? Am I, you know, how long of an exposure do I need to have to get this? Um, and, and on and on with endocrine disruptors and immunosuppressants. So the people who have moved are better off for sure. They've cut their exposure time, but many of them have been exposed already now for five years or so. Uh, they worry about their children. So, um, so that's the backdrop on, on, uh, on these cases that we have. Uh, so what I'd like to do is discuss two cases. One of them is, uh, the first one is the one Anne and Andrew there. Um, that's the third uh, chapter in the companion animal section. These people have moved now, um, is it three times? Three times. Uh, the first time was to escape uh, processing plant uh, contamination, air contamination. Um, second, and, second time was uh, air, water contamination. And then the third time uh, was uh, even worse water contamination. They are now living in a home uh, where there's not in a county, Butler County, uh, um, which is uh, north of, um, of Washington County and Greene County. So it's not an intensively drilled, it's not actually not Butler County. Which county is that that's up there? It's, it's, it's northwest Pennsylvania. Um, and it's, so it's in an area that's not intensively drilled. Uh, so what I'd like to set that backdrop and let me read. 
I'm going to start reading. It's uh, page 94 and 95. In September of 2011, approximately two years after moving to their current residence, and this was, again, um, the the fourth home, Anne sent a letter to the uh, Pennsylvania DEP with photos detailing the dumping of drilling wastewater on nearby dirt roads. She is concerned that once the material is dried, the contaminants in the wastewater will be inhaled and will cover crops grown for animals and people. She worries about runoff into streams, marshes, and swamps, and she is concerned about rural water wells and the Amish children who often walk these roads. Months later, she sent me an update the dumping continues, often in the wee hours of the morning, despite the no brine signs in her township. Uh, so effectively, what's happening in Pennsylvania right now is that some townships are banning um, wastewater being released on their roads. Um, and this is one township that did. They post no brine um, signs all over, yet these trucks come in in the middle of the night up from the south, where there's really intensive drilling, and they spread this waste all over the roads as fast as they can, and they get out before uh, daylight. So this is, is continuing. I just wanted to bring that up as a wastewater uh, case. OK, so the next uh, case I'd like to discuss is the last one uh, there. Um, and this is one that unfortunately did not make it into the book. Um, this is a beef cattle farmer who lives in um, Bedford, Bedford County, which is, um, if you look at the map of Pennsylvania, it's like south central uh, Pennsylvania. It's not an intensively drilled area. Uh, the problem that they have is they're very close to this very, very large compressor station uh, that's owned by Spectra Energy. Uh, and Spectra Energy is involved in um, another uh, a facility, expansion of another facility. Um, and, and those comments are under that FERC docket number that I, I made. Uh, but the, the problem with, with this is that uh, this compressor station, like other compressor stations that we've looked into with um, incidents that have happened, um, has numerous what are called blowdowns. Now, a blowdown is when uh, the compressor station has to stop functioning either due to uh, maintenance or due to emergencies. And when a compressor station stops functioning, all the gas flowing in has to stop. So they stop that gas flowing in, but it has to be vented or something's going to explode. And so that's what's called a blowdown. Um, so that sounds like, well, maybe that's not so bad if it's just venting some gas now and then. But, but it's more than that. So it's more than just natural gas being uh, released into the atmosphere, more than just methane. There's sometimes there are other uh, compounds and other chemicals that are oily sort of substances that they have actually documented covering their crops and their farm equipment. Um, the DEP has, has documented 10 incidents over three years. The community has documented at least three times that amount. And when I looked at the uh, um, incidents that the DEP documented, one thing stood out really um, um, uh, brightly here, and that was uh, valve problems. So when you have compressor stations, if your valves aren't working properly, you're going to have a lot of problems. So if you uh, you know, look at the comments that I've made uh, with this one. You can see that um, you know compressor stations have valve problems, and they have um, releases releases of chemicals like benzene, formaldehyde, um, and um, uh, other substances, uh, volatile organics. So, so these neighbors are suffering uh, because they live close by to this, this facility. Um, and again, this was a case that would have been great to have in the book, and I, was, I just couldn't include all of these cases. So I think I'm going to hand it back over to Robert. Okay. Okay, I, I just want to just set up the idea of, of oil and gas infrastructure, and the uh, other speakers are going to touch, talk more about this. The way I see it, there's several issues that we have to be concerned about, you know, since we do have a, at least a temporary ban on hydraulic fracturing in New York. One is the uh, storage of fossil fuels, and I just want to talk a second about, about that in a minute. Uh, the other thing are pipelines, compressor stations, and, processing plants, export terminals, that'll be covered a lot tonight, and I won't talk about that. And finally, wastewater disposal, which is an important issue. Uh, let me just mention, uh, because this is really uh, something that's, that we can, is sort of, sort of close to home for us. Seneca Lake is, we, we live on Cayuga Lake. Seneca Lake is about 20 miles from us. And right now, they, they're storing 1.5 billion cubic feet of uh, liquefied natural gas in the salt mines below the lake. Uh, FERC uh, 
has approved an increase to 2 billion cubic feet, possibly up to 10 billion cubic feet uh, of liquefied natural gas. Now, liquefied natural gas is methane that's cooled to two, minus 260 degrees centigrade and is continually vented to keep the pressure uh, the same. So we're continually releasing methane. To the extent that they use it, that's okay, but to the extent that it's released into the environment with the flare, flaring and venting, that's a serious problem. But what may be even a more uh, pressing issue is that they have proposed to store uh, 88 million gallons of, of liquefied petroleum gas, that's propane and butane, that's stored under high pressure to keep it a liquid. Um, and they're proposing to store that under the lake as well. Uh, now, this is under the control of our Department of Ener uh, Environmental Conservation, but they've not yet approved this facility, it's still up in the air. So one of the problems that we have with this is that the, the LPG caverns, at least, uh, have experienced collapses in the past. Now, we know that the, the ceiling has fallen in one of the caverns. We also know that we, we live in a seismically active area. I've been sitting in my office at Cornell University and have felt earthquakes. I felt my, my, my uh, office shaking in, on more than one occasion. So it's a seismically active area. We have caverns that are, that are unstable. And the geological reports on the stability of the caverns are considered proprietary information by Crestwood, the company that's doing it. Now, Seneca Lake uh, is it actually, you know, we've been there for a long, we've been in this area for, in upstate New York for a long time. When we got there, uh, Seneca Lake was sort of like the, the jug, wine, lambrusca capital of the world. And the last thing you'd ever want to do is drink wine made there with your dinner. Uh, that has changed dramatically, particularly over the last 15 years. Uh, it's really one of the world-class wine grow or wine producing areas in the world. We have, we're having people coming from Europe buying up the vineyards thinking that this is the next great area. So while this is being, while this, all this great stuff is going on in this region, we're getting, we're tr the comp competition is to turn the area into the major hub for liquefied natural gas and, and and liquefied petroleum gas in the Northeast. So we're talking about railroad lines, we're talking about a huge amount of trucking up and down these small country lanes. So there, there's a huge amount of uh, worry about this. It's also the drinking water source for 100,000 people, and it's related also to the drinking water source for Rochester, New York. In fact, the Rochester, New York City Council just the other day uh, issued a statement uh, against both the liquid, um, the liquid petroleum uh, gas storage in um, under Seneca Lake. So anyway, because of this, we're having community protests ongoing all the time uh, at the Crestwood facility, and so these are some of the the people that are working that are doing the uh, uh, protest. There have been some really important people that have been arrested. <laughs> This guy here was arrested on December 22nd. I think we can all, anybody that has kids gotta be really happy that he was able to post bail. Uh, <laughs> so Sandra Steingraber has been the person that's really led these protests. And, and what's happened actually is they, they started off, uh, you know, you know be, a lot of them being arrested. There've been more than 180 people arrested at this facility since uh, late last year. And they're no longer um, allowing them, to, even allowing them to go to jail for this. So they're 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 charging all of them fines. So they're they're hoping that people might want to uh, donate to their legal uh, support. And it's called their their website is wearesenecalake.com. Okay, so we're going to hear a lot about compressor stations and and LNG. Uh, facilities, but I just want to make a few comments. Actually, my field is not really this at all, is I'm more concerned with, I mean, what I get paid to do actually is to teach pharmacology and to teach biophysics at Cornell. So actually, when I started thinking about processing stations or processing plants for natural gas, compressor stations, 
uh, pipelines, et cetera. I started thinking of it in terms of pharmacology. That is, how, how, what happens when we take medication, okay? So if you take a, some medication one time and then look at what happens in your blood, that's, this is actually a program we developed, and we look at the, the blood level goes up and then it goes back down, eventually goes to zero. But if you're one of these people like uh, me that has to take things like Lipitor every day, uh, you're taking it maybe once a day, your blood level goes up, it starts to come down, then you take it again, it goes up and comes down a little bit, it keeps going up, finally it reaches a steady state. So I'm not here to talk about pharmacology, but this is really similar to what we have going on. If you're li living next to a well, your well might be flared and you'll get one big dose of toxicants. It would look like the um, slide over there on the left. But if you're living ne next to a compressor station or a, or a processing plant like Michelle lived at when she was a child, next to when she was a child, you will uh, know that their toxicants released continuously. In fact, they're probably released more on a cyclical basis, more at night so you don't smell them. So what happens in those cases is that you start taking them in your body and you end up having a steady state level over a long period of time. And that's the thing that really concerns me about infrastructure. Let me just mention a few other issues. We've treated those in the book uh, to some extent. Uh, but Wastewater is a huge issue with hydraulic fracturing, and w there are millions of gallons of water that are produced uh, at each well every time it's fracked, and when it's in before, and w actually up to the point, and even after it's put into into production. So we've heard lots and lots of problems associated with the fracking fluids, but that's not the end of the story. You're also pulling up things that have been settled into the ground, you know, 300 million years ago. It was an ancient ocean that had lots of salt, radioactive materials, et cetera, that come up with the hydraulic fracturing fluid. So it goes down in a toxic form. It comes up even more toxic. So what do we do with that? Well, there are several things that have been done. There are water treatment plants that, uh, that used to it used to be that in Pennsylvania, any water treatment plant would take it. But now there are special water treatment plants that will take it. But just recently, in the last week, there was a paper published showing that even those special plants that were supposed to be able to treat the water aren't able to do so effectively. Uh, the only good thing that they've been able to do with it is recycle it to some extent. They've been able to reuse some of the water that's produced to frack additional wells. This is somewhat of a good thing, but actually it does increase the toxicity and you still have to deal with getting rid of the toxic compounds. In, this, in, the, uh, in Texas, in Oklahoma, and to some extent in Ohio, and uh, Arkansas and various other places, they inject it into the ground into deep formations. Uh, this works okay in some cases. I if you get into areas that are seismically active, you can activate faults and have earthquakes. Oklahoma and Arkansas have had more earthquakes uh, in the last few years than they ever had in the past. And most of them uh, have been associated with either injection wells or more recently there have been some suggestions that some earthquakes have been associated with fracking, but I don't think that's as well uh, documented. Fi finally, what's done, Michelle referred to this as spreading the wastewater on roads. We know about that. Uh, it's also been used, or is proposed to be used for water softener pellets. And uh, in the West, they're actually allowed, I don't know if it's ever been done, but they're allowed to spread it on farmland for fertilizer. So we, what we worry about is all of these environmental issues. But what we want to do is say not just no to this, we want to go and find other ways of producing our energy. And uh, some of my colleagues at Cornell and some and colleagues at Stanford have, have produced a, a blueprint, uh, the Solutions Project, uh, that shows it's possible to generate almost all, if not all, of our energy through things like um, solar panels, as I've shown you here. And 
I have to stop now, but there, you can also do transportation with um, things that don't burn fossil fuels. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Robert and Michelle. Uh